Stars for the stars above. Our next guest speaker um, needs no introduction, but his name is Daniel Ellsberg, and he is our keynote speaker for the event today. Uh, he is known for his work on the Pentagon Papers, which brought an end to it which brought an end to the war in Vietnam. But more than that, he has served as a longtime activist, writer, and freedom fighter for many years, bringing attention to the important issues of our time. Ellsberg recently released his critically acclaimed memoirs, America's Doomsday Machine, Confessions of a Nuclear War Planner. It is an absolute honor to have Daniel Ellsberg here with us today, and I'd like you all to join me in welcoming him, welcoming him to the stage. heartwarming to see so many familiar faces here today. A lot of us have been coming here for quite a while, year after year. In fact, it occurred to me that um, I was reminded here sitting with my wife that it was in 1982 that she and I were in adjacent circumstance at Santa Rita having uh, blockaded Livermore and the Catholic worker, I think it was, mainly who organized hands around Livermore. Isn't that the case? Anybody here who was in that? Do you remember that? Uh, there was a great picture on the front of the um, <coughs> Chronicle with my son, Michael, who was, I don't know, he was six or so then, now about eight, uh, with a sign in this endless chain of people around Livermore saying, free mommy and daddy. Uh, <laughs> stop the MX. I've been doing a little research here since Mary Lee had told about uh, the new warhead that Livermore is making there now. And I was struck by the fact that it was first designed for the MX, which actually we stopped. That was the 10 warhead uh, missile, the Peacekeeper missile, which they deployed 500 of them. We got rid of them, and as a matter of, in the course of arms control agreements, both sides demerved. That may have changed now in Russia, it may be changing now here. That means came down to just one warhead per missile on their land-based missiles. Uh, for reasons I won't go into now, everybody in this business of looking at war planning, which I used to be, uh, knows that these MIRVED missiles, multiple warhead missiles, are particularly destabilizing because for two reasons, two reasons. In land-based silos, they are vulnerable to uh, uh, an opposing warhead. Can't be made invulnerable. That means that if there's any warning, as has happened several times, seriously, on both sides, that enemy warheads or other warheads are coming toward you as a false alarm when they're not, the leader of each side is faced with a choice by his military advisors either get your ICBMs off the ground or you will lose them. Well, what's the advantage? They will be destroyed shortly. Great expense uh, out there. What's the advantage of getting them off the ground? If you can do it before the enemy warheads have actually launched, that's much the better. But even if some have launched, the hope is the hope, which is a very profitable hope to pursue. You can still build ICBMs for that purpose, uh, even if it's too late to deter the attack, because they can hit the warheads that haven't yet launched on the other side. That's the supposed logic of all this. Most warheads, warheads are coming at you, but if you get your warheads off fast, they won't be destroyed on the land. And they can destroy if you target all of the, uh, all of these, sites that you know of on the other side, they can destroy their other warheads, so you will only have to suffer the incoming warheads, not the extra reloads or whatever else. What will this accomplish? Nothing. Nuclear winter will occur in either case, on either side, which is gone. But the idea is, you get them off the ground in face of a false alarm, as which I repeat, has happened a number of times, to no effect in the outcome of the war, because within a year of the war, an outbreak, an exchange between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, and now Russia, whichever started it, you wouldn't be able to tell which one started it. No one else would be, 
nearly everyone would be dead by the effect of the smoke lofted by these warheads the burning, on burning cities into the stratosphere where it would not burn out, go around the globe, stay there for 10 years or more, killing all harvests and starving nearly every human to death. That's the effect of a little war started by either side with low-yield weapons, which quickly escalates to an all-out war, or on a false alarm. Those are the risks that we are, the human species now, has been facing for over half a century. Now the peculiar thing about this warhead that struck me as I was just looking at it was, it is a land-based warhead, unlike the submarine warheads, which also give you nuclear winter, but don't tempt you to fire on a false alarm because they're invulnerable. So the incoming warheads will not destroy our submarine warheads. Our ICBMs cannot destroy their submarine warheads. So nuclear winter happens either way, whether or not you go. The bottom line on this is that ICBMs should not exist, uh, even in Cold War terms. Thinking now in terms even of uh, renewed conflict, whatever else to terms, thinking in Pentagon terms, which I can, I can still get back into that groove. Actually, I was in it for 10 years. By their own terms, not only has there been no rationale for these ICBMs and their warheads uh, for at least 50 years when the Russians developed many submarine warheads, they could not uh, target, it made no difference. And all which, during all which time, these ICBMs were the most dangerous weapons in the world because of their instability, because of the temptations they put on either side, the pressure to use them before they are destroyed. So we would be safer if we dismantled those unilaterally, immediately. The world would be safer. The same would be true of Russia, but you don't have to wait for Russia to do it, for us to make the world safer to do that. And uh, Adam Smith of the House Armed Services Committee has been considering, as uh, actually Obama did ask for the consideration of eliminating that third, quote, leg of the triad, uh, which is the most dangerous one. As a medium, but he, dis he discarded it. Another thing I learned just now, waiting here. The peak of warhead production, money, production deployment cost, was reached in uh, 1885, that's under Reagan. Um, it was, the Cold War ended soon after, and that peak spending, which was about $9 billion, was not exceeded until 2005, that's Bush. It was exceeded again in 2015 by Obama, and 2016, larger by Obama, and every year since. In the current budget, uh, Trump is asking for a 12% raise, but the budget for warheads, for Livermore, for keeping them at work, has risen every year, risen for the last seven years, starting under Obama. And it's now 40% higher than the Cold War height in the same dollars, okay? So the, the Cold, what we've been working at now for quite a while, as part of a movement has not succeeded, has failed year by year. The risks are at least what they are, uh, what they were at their worst during the Cold War, and actually there is no prospect, I would have to say, obviously this year, next year, the year after probably if Trump is re-elected, or if Democrat is re-elected with the same priorities as the past Democrats. So that has to change. What is possibly going to change it? We haven't done it yet. Well, making people aware somehow that this is the other existential crisis. Before, let's say, uh, climate took that stage as the existential crisis, uh, it was recognized that there was another one, nuclear, and that's almost got out of mind. At least it is in the consciousness, the climate problem of much of the world now. Thanks to some people I will name, there's just innumerable people, but one hero of mine that I met last year in Sweden, Greta Thunberg, who was then 16 years old, and 
Saturday, Saturday, I mean, days ago, the New York Times had an op-ed, which I just read, criticizing Greta Thunberg for being too impatient. She's only 16. She doesn't understand the complexities. She's got it. She hasn't had time to improve. This is almost an exact paraphrase. Improve her priorities and values, focusing on the fact that her generation is going to have its life shortened, her own generation, by... She's, by the way, the first described as the first world leader born in this century because she is. When Patricia and I visited her, it was about a month or so after she'd started um, sitting in front of the parliament every day with a sign saying, you must reduce fossil emissions, something to that effect, pointing out that Sweden, which prided itself on reducing its emissions, still was increasing them, as a matter of fact. It was doing things that would increase them, uh, reduce them, and also would increase them. So she was impatient about getting getting on with these. Well, by the time we saw her, there was about 60 uh, school children, essentially, uh, joining her uh, on a Friday on a strike from school. That was, I forget, in December or so. In March, millions of young people all over the world, I think in 120 countries, were on a Friday morning striking for uh, ending fossil fuel emissions and for this. That's the way. That is, that is not going to do it by itself because, as you know, we don't have a movement here uh, to do that with yet. And uh, we don't have the young people here yet. Uh, they're working very well, many of them, on climate. That's very good. If we can spend this year trying to convince some candidates, Democratic candidates, uh, and for the, for the House and Senate, which must change, on the importance also of the nuclear emergency. Uh, and by the way, the op-ed criticized her for calling it an emergency. That's rhetoric, extremism, and so forth. You know, incredible, but all, all, all too credible now. Okay, there is, we're still living with the possibility of extinguishing most human life and all the life of other species that are larger, let's say a squirrel, and smaller than us. They can't adapt the way they do. They go entirely, even if uh, humans don't. So uh, I am happy to see, uh, to be not the only, the senior person, most member of this crowd uh, at 88. Actually, how many are older than me right here? OK, very good. How many are older than 80? OK, and, and how many were uh, in some of these protests back in the 80s? Very good. OK, I am here to give you your Lifetime Achievement Awards. <laughs> We're, we watch the Oscars, Patricia and I know. We're the Lifetime Achievement Center. And uh, fine. So we're on the right track, but there has to be a lot more people. I will suggest, oh, one other thing, given what I've said. This warhead was originally de developed for the MX to be one of 10 on a single missile. Now we have 400 ICBMs that should not exist. They should be gone. They are developing new replacements for them. The ground-based strategic determinant. Why? For one reason only. And that is that Boeing and Lockheed make a profit building those weapons and uh, have always done so. And there is no other rationale you can possibly find for them. How about the W87-1? We already have a W87 weapons that does the same thing. I just read that W87, its only unique advantage, which is being uh, budgeted now, is so we can put three of them back on each MIRV missile and thus double or triple the number of warheads that will be vulnerable to attack, that can go over and so forth. That's the program. And this program was started, well, it really got underway heavily just this last year. What we want to do then, what I want to do is this. What's happened a lot before in the Vietnam War and in the nuclear arms race, and I stand before you here as somebody who participated in two moral catastrophes, the Vietnam War and the nuclear arms race. And then I kind of crossed the line and joined the people who were protesting those, and that's 
been a long time since. Without other people who are going to prison, going to jail, I don't think that the rallies themselves on nice Saturday mornings, or even on a nice morning like this, uh, would have persuaded me that it was worth sacrificing or giving my career, my life in prison, my job, my ev everything else. But those people put it in my head. So I know it's a useful action, civil disobedience, as Greta Thunberg is doing, and as Extinction Rebellion in London is doing. And Greta, by the way, is going to be here next month. She won't fly because of the fossil fuels. Uh, so what can she do? And they got a racing boat, uh, which uses solar panels, no fossil fuels. And, uh, it, there's only a couple of them in the world. And she's coming over, uh, she's flying, she's coming, she's coming over on this boat couple weeks and will be all over the uh, South America here as well and take miss no opportunity to see her. So that is a form of civil disobedience. Doesn't do it by itself unless it is part of a program to transform the Senate and I mean not only from the Republicans but from the past Democrats and the House and the White House we do have a chance as she points out. I believe that on a weekday like this with Livermore building 20 W87-1 weapons, which have a yield potential of 475 kilotons, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, you heard a lot about today, were together 35 kilotons. 475 in one warhead is 10 times Hiroshima and Nagasaki in one warhead. And they want to build hundreds to thousands of them. That should not be happening. The people in that death factory are producing weapons, each one of which is a portable Auschwitz. And they should not be doing that. And I am here today, but next year, if I'm not in Hiroshima, which is possible, but next year I will be here, but not at a gate that is closed for us for a mock arrest. I will find where the workers are getting into that plant and try to disturb business as usual. Because it has been true for many years, nuclear weapons must not be made in this country without having to arrest Americans to do it. And we'll, have to, we'll be telling them, I'm sure a lot of them will be telling them over our bodies. And they're willing to do that, but that gets some attention, and who knows, with all the other work combined with it, uh, we may save this planet. Thank you. I'm gonna let down my soul shield inside of Liverpool, yeah. Inside of Liverpool, yeah. Inside of Liverpool, I'm gonna let down my silver shield. Inside of Liverpool, I'm gonna stay with you.